start the recording and we'll get going. Okay. Hey everybody, welcome to Mindful Social. This week I've got the amazing and wonderful Mark Schaefer with us. He is a really well-known marketer, public speaker, author of several books, including Social Media Explained, Return on Influence, Born to Blog, The Content Code, and The Tao of Twitter. Maybe you say that, Tao of Twitter. And so I'd like to uh, talk this week about Mark's new book, Known, and we're going to talk a little bit about what that even means. So why don't we start there, Mark? Um, what does being known mean? Oh, that is a big question, Janet. <laughs> uh, you know, um, well, let me, let me tell a little story. To, 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 I think this will kind of encapsulate everything here and answer your question. Cool. A couple of years ago, uh, I was uh, bidding on the biggest consulting contract of my life. It was with the U.S. Air Force. And because it's a government agency, I had to go through a vetting process, and they had to interview me. So I got on Skype with these purchasing directors from the Air Force. It's a little intimidating. I didn't know these people. I'd never heard of them before. They were sitting behind this table. And so I was on the other end of the Skype call, and I was starting to explain why I was qualified to do this job. And about two minutes into my discussion, the purchasing director from the Air Force interrupted me. And she said, oh, Mr. Schaefer, we know who you are. We all read your blog. And right then I knew I had the job. Game over. Because I was known and my competitors weren't. So let's look at that little case study to kind of figure out what does known mean. All right. It doesn't mean I'm famous. When I walk down the streets of New York, I mean, nobody knows who I am. Sure. Although someone did recognize me in a market in uh, Cork, Ireland one time, which was pretty funny. Um, <laughs> So kind of shocking in a way, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not famous. So, so I'm not YouTube famous. I'm not Instagram famous, but I'm known in my field. I have the reputation, the authority and the presence to get my job done, to give me the very best possible shot for me to accomplish my goals. Now here's another characteristic of that of that from that scenario how did they know me through my content over years i've been creating content and i've built an emotional connection to these people through my content even though i didn't know them it was a meaningful connection they knew what i stood for they knew my values they knew how i thought and the types of topics that I write about. And so that established this authority, which gave me a permanent and sustainable advantage. Being known gives you an advantage over someone who isn't. So that's really a story that kind of shows what, what being known is all about and a little bit about how to get there. <laughs> well, I like all of that. So it's not just about being recognizable you know you mentioned YouTube stars for example uh, you know we may recommend recognize someone but I think the reason that the Air Force made a difference is because not only do they recognize who you are but they respect who you are and they've developed that respect through knowing you through the content that you make there's some kind of commonality perhaps in their way of thinking is that something that you want to be thinking about when you're creating content absolutely what you're what you're kind of hinting at here is that through the content i've created an actionable audience and that's different that from a social media audience that's a great misunderstanding that people in the world have today that having big numbers having a lot of followers on Twitter and LinkedIn doesn't mean those people will do something. It doesn't mean they'll hire you. doesn't mean they'll buy your book or invite you to speak because 
these social media connections are weak relational links. You can't really get them to do anything. You've got, you've got to do something extra to turn that weak relational link into something that is, is actionable. Now, the social media links, I think, are important because it opens a door. It, 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 you shake somebody's hand that maybe you never would have had an opportunity to, to meet before. It's an amazing time. That's, that's how you and I got connected. I mean, that's why we're here today. We started out as that little handshake, as that little weak relational link, and we, we followed each other for years, and we read each other's content, and we kind of helped each other out, and now we're collaborating on something. And I mean, that's great. That's how it works. But in the book, I talk about how do you do that? How do you not just rack up numbers, but build an audience that will really help create some sort of business value for you? Yeah, I, I totally agree that, you know, the, the numbers game is, is sort of ridiculous, but it is really amazing to me how you know, people like us can meet and you start to develop an actual relationship, even though you may have never met in person, and over time, you get such a really clear idea of who that person is, and it develops resonance. Not always. Sometimes you follow somebody for a long time, and it goes the other way, where you're like, wow, okay, they are just, nope, <laughs> don't want don't to go there. Yeah, or some, yeah, sometimes you meet them in, in real life, and you go, what? <laughs> is this the same person? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, social media fakery is, is really interesting to observe because there are people that I just love to watch them because you can see the games that they're playing and what they're trying to push people into. And I always wonder what happens when they actually meet somebody or do work for them, uh, yeah. you know, where that's going to go. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, uh, I, 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 believe, I believe you, and the, the funny thing is I, I don't see a lot of that, and the reason is this. Uh, when I see that kind of stuff going on, I unfollow those people. Mm. I, don't, I don't follow them it's because it just – what I found, Janet, is um, you know, I try to really stay centered. I really try to just pay attention to what I can control, what I do, the content I can create who I connect with how I help people and not really worry about anything else and honestly what I found was some of the trickery out there it was starting to bother me it was really bothering me and and I was like kind of being pulled off center because I saw a lot of behavior out there that um, it was sometimes uh, annoying sometimes unethical sometimes even dangerous in some ways because the advice that they were giving is just so bad that uh, I, I, I just felt, I just felt that, you know, it's just like, well, you know, they, they shouldn't be saying those types of things, uh, especially if there's a lot of new people to the business or young people following them. So literally what I've started to do is just unfollow, unfollow those, those people, um, you know, and just uh, my life's a lot happier. <laughs> That's really smart. You know, staying centered, staying focused like that just makes so yeah. much more sense because social media can be such a time suck. And, you know, I think for me, I love to watch the games and understand how they work. Um, I guess that's, you know, <laughs> that's me. Well, it is, it is, it is, it is very entertaining, but <laughs> you know, at, at, at the end of the day, it really has no impact it has zero impact on me because right. those those people are not my competitors i mean i'm going to you know i think the people who hire me have studied me and they they know what i stand for they know where i've been and uh so i'll i'll do fine despite whatever they do of course of course so let's talk a little bit more about that because you you talk a lot in the book about consistency and the importance of you know, creating a consistent path, consistent path. So can you talk a little bit about how to do that and why we should do it in the first place? Well, it's um, an interesting thing. It was really quite a profound learning for me in this book. And, you know, I have to uh, step back and say that when I write a book, I always let the research write the book. I'll, I'll have like a hypothesis 
at the beginning when I frame things. I kind of have an idea of where it's going to go, but what, where does it ultimately end up? I let the research kind of determine what the, what, what the truth is. And one of the things that I learned while writing the book is that consistency might be more important than talent. Wow. It might be more important than a big idea. The biggest mistake that people make is they quit too soon. And um, for my book, I interviewed nearly 100 people who are known in their fields throughout the world. And it could be sports, education, banking, um, real estate, construction, fashion, art, music. And what I found is that every person in every part of the world in every field followed the same path to be known. And the last question I asked them in the interview was if you could, you know, reach through the book to one of my readers, I mean, not in a creepy way, in a nice way <laughs> and, and give them some sort of piece of advice to encourage them. What would you say? And almost every person used some variation of the word consistency, hmm. resilience, tenacity, um, this ability to just keep at it. It, 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 it overcomes a lot. It overcomes a lot of sins. It overcomes a lot of deficits even just to outlast people. And of those people I talked to on average, it took them about two and a half years for the personal brand to really tip about 30 months. So, I mean, it takes a certain amount of grit, a certain amount of resilience having really a sense of purpose. I mean, it, it, you, to last that long, to really you know, create content that long, it's gotta be more about you and more about the money. You've gotta have an idea that what you're doing makes a difference. Even when you're uncertain of this, if this is the right path or not, you've gotta know, you know I'm making a difference here. Um, and that's what keeps, keeps people going. Mm -hmm. And that reminds me of a story that you tell in the book about, you know, if I was going to pick my favorite thing to do, it would be sitting in my boat in the lake reading a book. <laughs> so, you know, but you can't just be known for whatever it is that you're excited about. I think for me, it's because I've had years in the restaurant industry. It's those people who decide they're going to quit their jobs and open a cafe because it'll be easy. It'll be so easy. It's it my passion. Fun. It's my passion. Yeah. yeah. And not always a good idea, if ever a good idea. Well, it's almost never a good idea. Yeah. And uh, the reason, I mean, it's not just a difference of opinion. It's, it's just, that's what the research says that to follow your passion without a plan is almost always a recipe for failure. Um, and, and again, there's, there's lots of research, uh, that, that points to this, that you need to have a plan. And that's really what I'm begging people to do in this book is it's fine to have a dream. It's fine to have a passion, but before you, you suffocate everything in your lives and, and follow this with a single minded devotion, spend a couple days thinking about it, go through the exercises in this book and create a plan. Just think it through. Where do you fit in in this ecosystem? How are you going to become known? What are your competitors doing? Where are they publishing content? Where are they creating their, their marketplace? Think it through. Um, and the other, I think, major point in the book, which I, I thought might be a little controversial, but as it turns out, most people are saying, oh, yeah, thank goodness somebody finally said this, is that. Sometimes you don't follow your passion. Sometimes your passion follows you. I mean, when I was a little boy or a young man, uh, you know, I wanted to be a baseball player or I wanted to be an astronaut. Well, that didn't work out. I didn't, I didn't have a long-term dream of being a, you know, a digital marketer, marketer and a speaker, but that became my career. And now, I mean, I do love it. It is my passion. I have, fun every day it's it's i'm rewarded by this career every single day and i think that's what i find with with many many successful people is that they didn't follow the passion the passion follows them and that's certainly very legitimate 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. And I, I think that we all have things that, you know, we've done as hobbies, perhaps, where, you know, we've, we've really loved doing it, but it hasn't been something that we want to do every day. Uh, it took me years to start cooking again after leaving the restaurant industry and really yeah. enjoying it. You know, and I, I think that happens to a lot of people that they ex their passion expires right. because they've chased it too hard. So, right. Sometimes a hobby needs to stay a hobby. Yeah. You're going to ruin it if, if, you, if you try to make that your career. Yeah, it just gets tarnished by the actual function of working. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about some of the steps in the book. Um, where do we start? Well, the most important thing is to, to, to define what you want to be known for, which is really a little more difficult than it, than it sounds. And I replace the word passion with sustainable interest. I want to get people off this thing about, you know, if you can, if you can dream it, if you, you can be it, if you can be it, you can be, you know, see it, believe it, dream it, whatever, you know, these little rainbow bombs that we see on Facebook. Um, and what we need to think about is, okay, sustainable interest. So number one, it does have to be an interest. It has to be something that we really love, that we have fun with. Because if you don't have fun with it, you're going to quit. And you can't quit because it has to be sustainable. And this is something that you're, you're going to live with for months, maybe years, maybe the rest of your life, like me. <laughs> so it has to be a sustainable interest. So you really need to think about this and there are exercises in my book, which are a lot of fun, and you don't have to do all of them, but just pick a couple to help you define what do you want to be known for. And then the other important piece of this is, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't even have to be right, but you just have to take your best shot and put a little planning into trying to define what you wanna be known for. But chances are, it's going to be you know, tweaked a little bit as you go through the years. The second thing is now that you kind of know your story, you have to think about where am I going to tell this? You, in this very, very noisy world, um, you know, let's say your passion is uh, hamburgers. Well, you're not going to be able to get you know, maybe your voice heard above someone like McDonald's or Burger King. So you've got to have some angle about, you know, about hamburgers, hamburgers around the world, or, you know, ha how hamburgers changed my life or something. So now I got to so, start a new blog. Yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah, you do. So, uh, so you have to figure out where is an under you under occupied space, an uncontested niche. You have to hit them where they ain't. You can't go head to head with you know, lots of content that's already being dominant out there. So you might get lucky and you might, you might find an area where you're the first person, you're the first mover. There's, and there's lots of opportunities out there. So that, that is possible. But if you're going to be in a crowded area like, like food or fitness or fashion or music, you're going to have to find an angle. So an example I used in the book is, it's one of my favorites. There's a food blogger in Brazil who also loves movies and television. And what she started to do was create famous recipes from the movies and, and television shows. And she dresses up like the characters in the television shows or movies, and she makes these recipes. And that's become her thing. That's become her niche. It took her three years of doing that. That's kind of the sweet spot, two to three years. It took her about three years. Now she's got enough sponsorship. That's her career. She's making a living. She's doing cookbooks. That's what she's known for. Um, but she just, you know, she, she had her own take on 
food that helped her stand out. I really love that story. And, and here's an interesting thing for me anyway, that I had never heard of her or what she was doing, but because I read you and I know you, she became known to me. Yeah. So there is a trickle down effect of creating, you know, you also wrote return on influence, creating that influence, influential circle. And then how that feeds into other people that may not be connected literally or even in the same spheres. But there's a lot of, of transference that happens there. And, um, you know, so it, it goes beyond, um, you're not creating this in a bubble is where I'm wandering off to go. On this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I talk about, you know, this idea of influencers in the book because uh, it's an important idea because I mentioned that on average, it takes about two and a half years to become known. But that's an average. There mm -hmm. are people who did it in a lot less. There are a few people in the book that did it in about a year. And the way they did it was to connect with powerful influencers in their industry. Um, so one example is in, from the construction business. This guy had an idea where he could be an advisor to uh, kind of a consultant to construction businesses, and he found who's the most powerful voice in this industry, and he just offered his services for free. Mm -hmm. Turned this guy's business around. He started writing about this this fella and posting about this fellow and calling him his his business advisor. And then his you know his audience exploded, and the opportunity started to come because he had become associated with someone who already had a large, trusting, engaged audience. Mm -hmm. And so by, by, by helping to connect to someone else's trusted audience, it, it uh, kind of sped up the plan uh, for him. And it, he's, he's, he's done fantastic. I thought that was an incredibly smart thing to do because it really is challenging. I mean, construction, food, whatever it is, there are a lot of people who are already out there. Yeah. Uh, you know, some of us have been blogging about our topics for a long, long time. And, you know, you can kind of leverage that. But what if you really are just starting something fresh, you know, and, and you don't have, uh, you know, the history that, you know, really helps a lot, especially with social how can you overcome well, that? Is it all through connection? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's no, there's no shortcut that just like the example with me and the people at the Air Force. I mean, if I had only written one blog post, I never would have had that experience. If I only would have done one podcast or, or if, I, if I do one a year, it, it, I never would have built my, my brand, no matter – how many influencers I'm connected to. So you've got to do the work. You've got to create the content that allows people to get to know you, like you, and ultimately trust you. Mm -hmm. uh, so Sean, in this example, the construction example, he did that. He was creating blog posts and videos. He created uh, eBooks that he was giving away, uh, webinars, so he was, he was doing that work. He, he didn't take any shortcuts. But if, to accelerate it, especially if you're starting something new, especially if you're a startup that, and you don't have the luxury of those years and the patience to build an audience, tapping into a, a, an influencer you know, can be a shortcut. Mm -hmm. I recently had a really interesting conversation with Steve Rayson, the founder of uh, BuzzSumo, who has analyzed probably more content than any person alive. And he had a really interesting comment about how content goes viral. He said that a lot of people think, well, it's like a spider web where someone sees it and they share it. And then 10 people in their audience share it, share it, share it. And that's how it goes. He said, that's not really how it goes. Mm -hmm. He said, what really ignites content, it's, it's almost like, you know, bomb blasts from influencers going off. It's not like this little delicate little spider web of, of, of connections that, that makes the content go. It's the repeated, it's almost like, you know, the, the, you know, the carpet, carpet bombing of big bloggers, of big influencers saying, look at it. And when you start to see, see it out there enough, you go, oh, okay, 
this is a book I need to read, or this is a blog post I need to see, this is a person I need to follow. <clears throat> so it really is you know, creating something that, that's gonna be viral. It's not about like spreading a virus. It's like infecting an influencer <laughs> and, 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 and getting, getting, getting the influencer. This is, this is take bombs and viruses. This is getting really weird and ugly. <laughs> We need to change the topic here soon, but but it, I need or I need I need I need to come up with better with better analogies, <laughs> Janet. But the idea is is that influencers are uh, are tremendously important, tremendously important in, in in the world today, and a lot of people hate that. They think it's icky. Maybe they even feel a little jealous that certain people have more power than others. I mean, maybe it feels a little like high school where, you know, that person's a 10 and that person's a seven, but you know, you got to take the emotion out of it and just look at the raw business value that we're moving inexorably toward an advertising free world. People don't want ads. They don't like ads. They block ads and avoid ads in every way that they can, but they do listen to people that they trust. They listen to their friends. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these influential people on the web, just like you said, it's amazing how strong you can feel about somebody and never, never meet them, never talk to them. It's all through their content. And so it, it, it is a legitimate way to get things done. It really is. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. You can really get to know someone and, or at least think you get to know someone through social. And I, I think the other thing that that sparks in me is that the difference between what some people think are influencers and some that aren't. And, you know, to me, my definition of an influencer is someone who actually can influence someone else and encourage them to make a change or educate them in some way. It isn't somebody who has tons of, of followers and can just send out a lot of spam. Uh, you know, I, I know that there have been a lot of famous um, mentions of people, Kim Kardashian, for example, who sell their tweets, thinking, and people buy that. They spend thousands of dollars. So mm -hmm. Kim Kardashian will post, you know, a tweet mentioning them. I don't think that would work for me. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think so. <laughs> you mean you wouldn't hire Kim Kardashian? I don't even actually know which one she is. $220,000 $220, a tweet. Whoa, really? Yeah. Oh my gosh. And by the way, I'm, I'm a lot cheaper than that. <laughs> I'm dirt I'm cheap. Gonna, I'm gonna encourage you to tweet this show, so we're yeah. all gonna test this. I'll, I'll, I, tweet, I, 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 I tweet for, I basically, I'll tweet for snack food. <laughs> Do I have to send peanuts? <laughs> But it is interesting to me because I don't think anybody pays any attention to those tweets. Um, I don't think anybody, I think people now recognize when there's a paid sponsorship involved, but yeah. brands are still going for it. They're still pushing them out there. And in the end, it dilutes that person's overall yeah. influence. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it, it, I'm, I'm actually working on a project right now. Um, for a company that's in the the influence sort of um, tracking and measuring um, business. And I'm interviewing a lot of people who work every day in influence marketing. And when it gets to measurement, it is still a big question. Now there people are, there are, they're making improvements. They're making progress for sure. But and I'll give you an example. So, uh, I used to do some work for IBM and IBM brought me in to visit the team who worked on uh, Watson. So they're exposing me to like premium content, premium insights. Now, when I got back to my life, I, I found that the things I learned about Watson started showing up in blog posts and speeches and college classes and they're mentioned in a book. Now, IBM didn't pay me to do that. Mm -hmm. I just went to a conference and they brought me in and I had these experiences. Now, so that's one key idea is that I was an authentic advocate. 
I was most effective because I really believed in what this company was doing and what was happening with Watson. And the second interesting thing is all those powerful things that I mentioned, blog, speech, class, book, would not show up on a social media influence dashboard. Mm -hmm. None of it. Nope. Right? And a lot of it, most of it is Twitter centric. And Twitter is the least powerful social media platform out there right now. It's basically a broad, a broadcast channel. The most powerful influence channel for me is my blog because people, I'm, I'm you know, a, a woman recently wrote me and she said, I start my day with a cup of coffee and your blog post. I, I am part of the fabric of her life. I, that is real influence when she looks forward to my blog and, 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 and what I do. And, but how do you measure that? I mean, you can't, you, you're lazy. You're a lazy marketer. If you think the person has influence because they have a lot of Twitter followers and a lot of tweets, mm -hmm. that's not what it's about. So what I'm challenging companies to do is, is to, is almost, you got to talk to these influencers. You got to survey them and say, how are you using this information? Where is it showing up? And uh, so that message is starting to get out a, a, a little bit because measuring true influence just based on social media breadcrumbs is almost impossible. Well, it is impossible. It's impossible. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, share a voice mentions even, you know, if they're looking at their Google Analytics and, and maybe they're sending out UTM codes that are specific to the content, whatever it is, yeah. it doesn't work. It helps. It helps. It helps. I mean, it helps. It yeah. helps. But it's but like it's, a billboard or a magazine. Yeah. You know, yeah. if I pick up a magazine that's six months old in my dentist's office and I buy something based on something I read, there's no way for them to track that either. Right. Yeah. Right, right, right. Exactly. So, you know, we, we, we still have a long way to go. But I think the potential of influence marketing is undeniable. Um, the importance of it, the increasing importance of it is undeniable, mm -hmm. but we just have to figure out, you know, we how, better metrics and, yeah. and, and, you know, and, and it, some, it, in some cases it may never be there. It may just be kind of a, a, a leap. We, we may have to rely on, on, on more qualitative measures than quantitative measures, stories yeah. of success. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, if someone wants to develop that kind of influence, they're going to want to start by being known. And yes. And I think that definitely means that they need to read your book. Definitely. But, <laughs> definitely. And also your blog, which I, too, think is fabulous, and I, I share it all the time because there, there is a lot of wisdom in there, both from you and your guest posters as well. Why don't you tell people how to find your blog and the book and how to find you on social media, even Twitter. You can find everything about me at businessesgrow.com. Uh, my blog is there. I have a very funny marketing podcast I do with Tom Webster called The Marketing Companion. It's a lot of fun. And you can find my books and lots of other resources for marketers in companies of any size, really, all at businessesgrow.com. That's great. Thank you so much for being here, Mark. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Janet. Thanks so much. It's been fun. It has been fun. It's always fun to talk to you. And I will let people know that this will be on my YouTube channel. It will be on mindfulsocialmarketing.com and also my podcast and it's syndicated every place. So go to mindfulsocialmarketing.com or janetfouts.com and you'll see the recording show up there. Thanks again. Thanks, Janet. Bye-bye.